morning, everyone. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to Genesis, the book of Genesis. We'll be taking a little bit of a survey today of uh, Abraham's life. You're going to hear me, or you're going to hear the scriptures refer to him in some of our, our time together as Abram, because that was his name before God changed it. But uh, we know him, you probably know him as Abraham, so that's how I'm going to refer to him. And as always, I want to start off with a little game. We don't always start with a game, but I try to start with something to get you thinking and to connect with you on our big idea. So today it's a game. I'm going to see if you guys can fill in the blank. Have you ever played fill in the blank? I'm going to give you a phrase. The phrase has three words for you Wheel of Fortune fans. All right? It's a phrase. Three words. It's a common phrase. It's not a hard phrase. It's not a trick phrase. It's a phrase you've heard a lot in your life. Probably heard it on the playground, maybe on the racetrack. And it, it usually involves somebody holding a flag or holding their hand up for our radio listeners who are trying to think of the phrase. Are you ready? I'm going to say the first two words, and I want you to see if you can fill in the blank on the third. It goes like this. Here's the phrase. Ready, set, go. That's right. Ready, set, go. We have all heard that phrase. We know that phrase. We can relate to that phrase because we have lived that phrase. How many of you believe that a good start is better than a bad one? When you hear that word or that phrase, ready, set, go, it means it's time to start. And if you want to win the race, it's important you get a good start. The shorter the race, the more important the good start is, right? If you have a, a long race to run, you can overcome a bad start. And a good start maybe isn't quite as important, but it's, it's, it's better than a bad one still, I mean, think about it for you sports fans. Would, would you rather score nine runs in the first inning of a baseball game, or would you rather be the team that's playing against the team that scored nine? Would, would you rather go into halftime at a football game up by 40 or down by 40? Now, we've all seen games where people come back. You can, you can overcome a bad start, but it's a whole lot better if... You just have a good start to start with, amen? We all want to have a good start. That's our big idea for today. A good start is better than a bad one. And that's really why I put the gratitude journal together, the devotional I spoke of last week. Again, you don't have to buy it to be a part of this series. But the 60-day journal takes you on a journey to have gratitude in your life and to start every single day with gratitude. Because if you start your day or if you start your week or if you start your month sad and mad and bad, it's hard to overcome that. It's hard to get past it. It's not that it's impossible. But if you start your week or your month or your day with gratitude, if you start it with gladness, if you Start it with a heart that is full of God. It's a whole lot easier to have a good day. Because a good start is better than a bad one. Today I want to share with you a few things from the life of one of my favorite people in the Bible. His name is Abraham. Abram or Abraham. That's how we commonly refer to him. And his story and his journey is an important one to our faith. We're not going to have time today to dive into all of it. But it's important to the foundation of our faith. But inside of this man's life was a, a great sense of gratitude. His story and journey with the Lord are found primarily in the book of Genesis, but he's also mentioned in the New Testament. He's a guy that God made a great covenant with that still affects all of us today in our world today. He promised to make Abram into a great nation, to lead him to a, a promised land. Here's what it says in Genesis 12, 
Starting in verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Can you imagine God saying those words to you? All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. What a great promise. But despite the clear and convincing call and command of God on his life, Abraham, like all of us, didn't always get a good start. He struggled at times on his journey. He doubted. He became discouraged. He became distressed. There were even times on his journey where we could describe him as being distraught and not knowing what to do, even though God had given him such a clear command. But the portions of his journey, the the parts of his journey that are marked with faithfulness and the parts of his journey that are marked with the greatest blessings are also the parts of his journey that are marked with the greatest gratitude. There are a few things that I think helped Abraham get a good start and a few things that I think still today can help us get a good start when it comes to gratitude and when it comes to faith in our daily journey with the Lord. And the first one is just that, it's faith. Point number one is faith. If you want to get a good start, you have to have faith. This is probably what Abraham is the most well known for today, primarily because of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, known as the hall of faith. He's a central figure of many in that chapter. It says this in Hebrews 11, 8 and 9 of Abraham, by faith... It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. And he set out for a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. It takes a lot to walk in faith. Amen? If you didn't say amen, you've probably never tried it. It takes a lot to walk in faith. To be called by God is one thing, but to obey God is another. Every single one of you who can hear my voice right now have been called by God to something. But not every single one of you have obeyed God, have you? You see, it's one thing to be called and commanded by God. It's another thing to obey. Abraham wasn't just called. He wasn't just commanded. He actually obeyed. He actually walked in faith. He set out for a place that he didn't even know about. A place where he didn't even know that he was going. And he would live there as an outsider. The text says he lived as a a foreigner in the place that God promised him. This is the way it's described in Genesis 12, verses 4 and 5. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. He obeyed. And Lot went with him. Abram was, catch this, y'all. Abram was 75 years old when he left for this journey. He took his wife, his nephew, and all the possessions that he had accumulated and all the people he had acquired And they set out for the land of Canaan. 75 years old. How many of you are 75 years old or older? Do you want to move right now? (laughs) Do you want to pack up and move to a place you don't know about at 75? Do you want to just go start all over? Leave your family, leave your friends, leave every acquaintance you know. Go to a place you've never heard of before. Live in the middle of some remote jungle where you have no idea which mushroom to eat and which one not to eat. You don't know nothing about this place. Does that sound fun at 75? I mean, that sounds like an adventure a 20-year-old might take. It, It sounds like an adventure a teenager certainly would be 
naively excited about. (laughs) But at 75, imagine the faith of this man to leave his homeland where he's rooted and established, to leave the place where his name is respected and he has a great family history, to go to a new place that he doesn't even know about, to inherit a promise he's never even heard of and and something that sounds way too good to be true. You've heard the old saying, if it's too good to be true, it probably... God told him everybody on the whole world, all the peoples of the whole earth are going to be blessed through him. That sounds a little too good to be true, doesn't it? I mean, there had to have been some sense in Abraham going, man, what is going on here? Imagine the faith. But even this man wasn't always faithful. In fact, several times in his journey, he got away from faith. Several times his fears overtook his faith, and each time that happened, it caused him some major trouble, some major problems. But you'll notice this pattern when he starts with faith, it's always better, because a good start is better than a bad one. You know what every day brings? A new start. You know what every week brings? A new start. Every new month brings a new start. Every new year brings a new start. We have a lot of opportunities for new starts in our lives, so why not start well? Why not start as good as you can? And starting well means, in part, starting in faith. There are three things I do every day, or three things I try to focus on every day, every week, every month, every new year that I have found that helped me start well. And I would encourage you to use these as a good starting point for you too. They're not in your bulletin, but you can take a note and write them down. They're simple things. The first is prayer. Before I even get out of bed in the morning, I talk to God. That's partly because I don't like to get out of bed in the morning. (laughs) But it's also partly because before I have a conversation with anyone else or before I attempt anything for God, I've got to spend a little time with God. I take the opportunity not only to talk to Him, but to listen to Him, to sit in the stillness and the quiet, to just let Him know that I'm prepared and ready to obey and to do whatever it is He has for me that day. To let him know that I recognize and fully realize that yesterday is gone and whatever I missed is gone and whatever problems were there are gone and it's a new day and I'm ready to follow him into it. I start with prayer. It doesn't take a long time, usually, sometimes it does, but it's a good way to start a good day. Second thing I do is spend time in the Bible Um, I don't do this right after I get out of bed. Usually I take a shower. Most of the time during the week, I come up to the office to do it where it's quiet. But I spend about 15 minutes, sometimes 20, 25, but usually 15 minutes going through two daily devotionals that I regularly approach and spend time in. I meditate on the scriptures that are offered there and the big ideas that are offered there and just kind of center and focus my mind And then, sometimes right after that, sometimes right after lunch, I spend another 20 to 30 minutes going through my read through the Bible in a year plan and just spend time in God's Word. I've found it's a good way to start my day. And I've discovered that a good start is always better than a bad one. (laughs) So I pray and I read God's Word early in the day, trying to get a good start in the day. And then the third one is, is one that I've recently, over the last year, been more dedicated and disciplined to, and it's made a tremendous difference in my life. Again, it's why I put the gratitude journey together. The third thing is, is I find something to be grateful for. It's hard on some days to find something to be grateful for. There's always days where you struggle with that, but I make it a point to every single day at the start of my day, find something to be thankful for. Even when I'm having a rough start, or even when yesterday didn't go good, or even when I have a week that 
has a bunch of stuff in it that's causing me some fear and anxiety. I, I try to find something to be grateful for because I've found that if I start with prayer and if I start with the Bible and if I start with gratitude, it gets me a good start. And a good start's always better than a bad one. The combination of those three simple things have made a profound difference in my life. Abraham would not have had such a great start without being a man of great faith, a man who was connected to God and a man who was connected to gratitude. He was a thankful man, thankful for all that he had, and he was a faithful man. The second word I'll give you today is foresight. Abraham had great foresight. He had the ability to look ahead. We all know this. We all know that foresight is important. We all know that foresight matters, but not all of us spend much time working on it. We all know that foresight helps us. It helps us avoid pain and tragedy and hardship and temptation even. For example, we don't build our homes in neighborhoods that are on the bottom of a creek, do we? Or on top of a swamp. Well, unless you're New Orleans or Houston, but we, we can't speak for everybody. But we, we wouldn't normally do that, would we? Because we have the foresight to know that even though it doesn't rain a lot in our part of the world, it does from time to time rain. And if we build our home down in a creek, or if we build our home down by the river right on its banks, there will come a time when it's going to wash away. We have the foresight to know better. You don't smoke on an airplane. Not, not because you don't want to smoke. You don't smoke on an airplane because you have the foresight to know where are you going to hide? Where are you going to go? How are you going to get away whenever they come and say, hey, mister, put that out? And you have the foresight to know you don't want to pay the fine and the consequences that come with that. We have the foresight to know that the opening weekend of deer season is not a good idea to plan a men's event on that weekend. <laughs> there's, there's just, it, it's not a lack of faith, it's just foresight that helps us to determine that, hey, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. I, I don't know if y'all are like this, but when my kids were little, we used to go to the zoo, and, and I, I love watching the lions. And I would stand there at the rail, and I would think, that's not really that far. I can make that jump. I, I could totally jump over that. Not just the rail, but that little ditch that's right there. It's not that big of a ditch. I could totally make the jump. But I never have. You know why? I've watched Animal Channel, and I, I have the foresight <laughs> to know what would happen if I ended up on the... It's not that I couldn't make it. It's just that I'm not sure I can make it back. <laughs> And I have the foresight to know it wouldn't be good to jump in there. It's why at the beginning of football season, nobody goes out and buys a cap that says Dallas Cowboys, Super Bowl champions. Because you have the foresight to know that's not going to happen. So why would you do it? See, you have foresight. You use your foresight all the time as you go through life. You have it. Why not put it to use in a positive way? Why not put it to use in a way that helps you get a great start? Look at what it says in Abraham, of Abraham's life in Hebrews 11.10. It says, for he was looking where? He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He was looking forward. He had foresight. He was doing more, though, than just looking forward. He was looking forward to the right things. That's important. You see, it's been my experience that most of us use our foresight in the wrong way. It's important that you use what you have, your foresight, in the right way. You see, most of us use our foresight not to look forward to the things that are good, not to look forward to the things of God. We use our foresight and we look forward to the things we want to avoid. We look forward to a meeting we don't want to attend. 
We look forward to an encounter that we know is going to be difficult or a conversation that we know is going to be hard and we worry about it. We look forward to an outcome that will probably never ever happen, but we worry about it for weeks and months anyway. We look forward to a situation that's even less likely to happen than the Cowboys winning a Super Bowl, and we we worry about it, and we fret about it, and we live in fear over it for days, weeks, months, even years of our lives get wasted using our foresight in the wrong way. What if you used your foresight to look forward and to focus on the good things in life? What if you used your foresight to look forward to focus on the God things in life like Abraham did? He was looking forward to things he knew he would never see with his own eyes, but he knew that God would do. Paul's another great example of this. I love what Philippians 3, 13 through 15 says. Paul says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. You know, there was a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff on the horizon of Paul's life when he wrote those words. There was a lot of stuff he saw coming. He saw his own death approaching. He's in prison. He's chained. He's suffering for the Lord yet again. And he doesn't use his foresight to worry about those earthly things. He doesn't use his foresight to fret and to frown and to be mad and sad about those things. No, he looks forward. Not in fear and not in worry and not in dread and not in anxiety. But instead he chooses to look forward with great expectation. He looked forward with great hope. He looked ahead knowing that God was faithful and that God had a great plan for his life. He used his foresight to look ahead and make a choice to focus on the goodness of God and the grace of God and the generosity of God and the glory of God and the greatness of God. And when you use your foresight like that, guess what the result is? Joy and gratitude. You have foresight. Why not use it? Why not start your day, your week, and your month? Why not start every new year with great foresight, looking ahead to what God has planned for your life? That one simple thing can make a great difference in your life can make a great difference in the level of gratitude you carry into the day or the week or the month or the year. A good start is always better than a bad one. And starting with the right mindset when it comes to foresight is a way to get a good start. There's a third thing I see in Abraham's life that I think is important for us today. It's the word flexibility. He was a man of great flexibility. I know this is probably going to surprise Most of you who are looking at me with your eyes certainly is going to surprise those of you who know me, but I'm not very flexible. My wife is amening down here on the front row. I'm not a very flexible person. You probably thought I was by looking at me, but but I'm just not. Certainly not near as flexible as I used to be. Now, my daughter, my daughter Tatum, is a gymnastics person. She's in competitive gymnastics. Now, that girl is flexible. Just yesterday, she, she, she did something I've only seen one other person in my entire life do. His name is Gerald Hill. He's the only person I've ever seen do this. She took her hands in our house... She clasped them together like this, and then she jump roped without breaking her hands over her hands. I've never seen that in my life, except for Gerald. Gerald did it one time, and I was impressed. But, I mean, it's so flexible. I could not believe it. I watch her out there on the mat, tumbling and flipping and flopping and on the beam and 
doing things on those bars. And I'm like, how does she bend around like that? I mean, I'm not like that. I had a dream this week I was. I was dreaming I was on the gymnastics floor and I did her whole routine. I did it well. It was great. (laughs) I was flipping and flopping and rolling and tumbling, doing the whole thing. I came up, got a perfect 10 from all the judges. It was awesome. And y'all, I woke up from that dream and had thrown my back out. (laughs) That's how not flexible I am. Even in my dream, I can throw my back out. I I had to go to the chiropractor and get a massage this week because my lower back was gone. I'm just not flexible. And, and, you know, I say that to get y'all to laugh and stuff. It's true, though. I threw my back out. Um, But, you know, as I think about that, there's other areas of my life I'm not very flexible in. And I suspect I'm not the only one. It's easy to get rigid and not be flexible. I'm not the most black and white person I know. I'm not the the strictest, most rigid rule follower that I know. I'm not the least flexible person in life that I know. But I'm not near as flexible as I used to be. And I'm probably not near as flexible as God needs me to be. Because, hear me, church, when we become too rigid and when we lose our flexibility, we can very quickly and very easily turn into modern-day Pharisees. Now, when it comes to the Word of God and obeying the commands of God, I'm not saying we need to be flexible. I'm not saying we need to, you know, please don't misread this and please don't read between the lines here and think I'm saying, like, we, you know, we need to give to the culture or anything like that. No, I mean, there's, there's plenty of times where we have to stand on truth and the Bible and what God says and everything else. But, but there can also be flexibility in our spirit and our hearts and our speech and our life and our approach and our angles. It doesn't mean we, we have to become rigid. Because if we do, we just turn into these modern day versions of Pharisees and And it didn't work out real good for them. Jesus didn't have a whole lot of real good things to say about them. I think about the instance in Mark chapter 2 verse 27 where Jesus told them that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. They had become so stiff-necked and so rigid over that day of rest called the Sabbath that they had turned something God intended to be a blessing for people, they had turned it into a curse. And Jesus, he rebuked them for it because they were too stiff. I think about places like Matthew 23, 23, where Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And there's this whole section here in Matthew that talks about this. Hypocrites, you pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. He calls them blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel, he says. Ouch. I don't want Jesus to say that about my life. I don't want to become so focused that I lose my flexibility and refuse to be flexible in areas where God permits it. I've noticed that in general, the most grateful people I know in life tend to be the most flexible too. So if I want to be more grateful, I've got to learn to be more flexible. And this is one thing that the gratitude journey has really helped me with. Learning where and when and how to be flexible. It's helped stretch me and expand me and make me flexible. Abraham showed great flexibility during his own journey. I think of places like Genesis 13, verses 8 through 11. It says, So Abram said to Lot, Please, let's not have quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, since we're relatives. He says, Isn't the whole land before you? Just separate from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked out and he saw the entire plain of the Jordan. As far as Zoar, 
well watered everywhere like the Lord's garden in the land of Egypt. This was, of course, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the entire plain of the Jordan for himself. And then Lot journeyed eastward and separated. They separated from each other. When you read that, you can just sense a spirit of flexibility in this old man. Abraham. He just says, you pick the land. You, you pick what you want. You, you pick it first. I'll take whatever's left. You go whatever direction you want to go, and I'll just go the opposite. And I'll be happy about it and grateful for it. I'm just glad there's some land I can have. Abraham says, I trust God. I can be flexible here. This isn't a hill to die on for me. And I find this amazing because Abraham is the old man. He's the older one of the two. He's the one who's in charge. He's the one who had more of everything. He's the one who had helped make Lot who he was. He's the one who had the authority. He could have very easily and very quickly told Lot, hey, I'm going to go this way and you go that way. We're going to separate. And Lot would have had to. But he took a more flexible approach. Instead, he chose flexibility. He exercised flexibility. And you know what? God blessed him, didn't he? He was just thankful he had somewhere to go. He was willing to accept whatever Lot didn't want and be thankful for it. If you want to get a good start to your day, your month, your year, or your gratitude journey, learn to be flexible. Make it a point to be flexible where you can. And I promise you this, as your flexibility increases, so will your gratitude. Let me close with this last one, and it's probably going to surprise you. I didn't include it just because it has an F. I, I included it because it's important. And some of y'all are going to want to discount this one completely, and you're going to close your ears as soon as I say the word. But I promise you this one is important, so I hope you'll listen. It's the word finances. Oh, I heard a, oh, I, I heard that. It was over on this side, spiritual people over here on this side of the room. I know where my people are. I'm going to look at y'all the rest of the time. It's the word finances. It's a tough one. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about. And I'm using the word finances here because for most people, when it comes to generosity, the finance part is the hard part. I mean, most of us will be generous in other areas of our life pretty quick. I mean, we'll be generous with our time. We'll help a friend move, or we'll volunteer in an event, or we'll do something for a booster club or something our, our kids are doing or involved in. We'll, we'll do that at the drop of a hat because it's just easier than our finances and being generous there. Or we'll use our talents in some way. We'll coach Little League or soccer. We'll We'll take a talent that we have and help a friend build a bookshelf or fix their leaky toilet. We'll take whatever talent we have and put it to work for somebody else and not charge them for it. We'll, we'll do that pretty quick and pretty easy most of the time. But when it comes to our finances and being generous there, well, that, that's just a lot harder. And listen, I, I know times are tough and I know things are hard. And I, I know things are shaky and unstable, and I know interest rates are high, and stuff is, is difficult right now. And so that makes that temptation even harder. It, it makes it even harder to be generous with our finances. One of the most unique things about Abraham's journey is that he was a giver. If you read about his life, he was generous in so many ways and to so many people. But it started with his finances. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, it says this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God most high. He blessed him and said, Abraham, Abram is blessed by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. God didn't ask him to do that. At least we have no record of it. God hadn't instituted the tithe or the giving of a tenth at this point. Abraham did it cheerfully and willingly, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. He gave it to Melchizedek, who was God's priest. It's the first reference of giving a tithe in the Bible. If you keep reading this passage, you'll see that there's a wicked king, the wicked king of Sodom, 
is also present at this meeting, and he tries to make a deal as a wicked king will with Abram. And Abram doesn't take it. In fact, he says this. He says, I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the share of the men who came with me, they can take their share. I don't care. Again, we see his flexibility and his generosity come together here at work. What happened was Abram was the victor of a great battle, and he was, as the victor, entitled to the spoils. But instead, he was generous. He was generous towards God. He was generous towards this wicked king of Sodom. Said, hey, you keep everything that was yours. I don't want any of it, though he was entitled to it. I don't want you to ever look at me and say, I'm rich because of what I got out of your kingdom. You have it all back. The other people who were with him, the other people who helped, he said they can all take their share. I don't care what they do with it. That's generosity. Would have been easy for him to hold on to it, but he didn't. And he presents this tithe to Melchizedek. I think we can all agree that a good start is better than a bad one. And Church, I'm just convinced that one of the reasons many people get off to a bad start is because they refuse to honor the Lord with their wealth. I've seen it time and time and time again. And it doesn't get you off to a good start. You think it's going to get you ahead. You think it's going to get you a good start. It it makes sense from an earthly point of view. I totally get that side of the coin. But I'm just telling you, it's going to get you off to a really bad start. You give God little tips instead of a true tithe. That's what most people do. They tip God. They They don't tithe. If the sermon's good, you tip a little more. The pastor didn't come visit you at the hospital, you tip a little less or not at all. But it's a tip, it's not a tithe, it's not from a place of gratitude or cheerfulness or obedience. It's just a tip, you just give a little bit, you give whatever you have at the time or whatever you think you can afford. As believers, we're not called to tip God, we're called to tithe. It means a tenth. And we're not just called to tie the tenth, we're called to tie the tenth from our first fruits to the kingdom. It's supposed to happen on the first day of the week. It's supposed to happen right here in his house. It's supposed to be one of those things that gets us off to a good start and positions our heart in a place of generosity and joy and gratitude. And it's supposed to be something God uses in our life and then goes and uses in the lives of others. God says, bring me the tithe. Bring me the tenth. Malachi 3, 8 through 10, will a man rob God? Oh, sure you will. He says, yeah, you'll rob me. You're robbing me right now. How do we rob you, they asked. And he said, by not making the payments of the tenth, the tithe, and the contributions. You're suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessing for you without measure. It wasn't too long ago I was sitting with a friend and he asked me a profound question. He said, do you think it's okay if I don't tie the full tenth so I can keep food on the table. In fact, his exact question was, do you think it's okay if I don't tithe so I can provide for my family? That's how he phrased it. And I, I said, well, I mean, I was, I was dumbfounded because I'd, I'd never met anybody who was tithing who couldn't provide for their family. Because God says, if you tithe, I'm going to take care of you. So I was like, well, I don't know, this doesn't make sense to me. But So I wanted to probe a little bit deeper. And I said, well, what do you mean by provide for your family. And he said, well, you know, man, things are expensive. Interest rates are up. You know, everything at the grocery store is more expensive. This, 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 this. He was going on with all the normal stuff. And he said, we just, we can't afford to tithe and keep food on our table. Now, we happen to be sitting in his 
fairly new, couple month old, F-350 Platinum, jacked up every bell and whistle you can get on these things. And, and we're friends. And he asked a question. So I decided to ask him one back. I said, how much is the payment on this truck? And he said, well, you know, it's about fourteen fifty a month. Hmm. I said, just a few months ago, last year, your wife got a brand new, tricked out, every bell and whistle you can get at SUV. How much is the payment on that? I forget what he said, 1200 a month, somewhere in that range. Hmm. Said, how much do you spend on cable TV? Because <laughs> he's got all the sports channels and, you know, Red Zone and all these things. So, oh, like three, three hundred and fifty, four hundred a month. Hmm. And I just kept asking questions. We're friends. I know a lot about his life. He knows a lot about mine. And finally, he said, uh, uh, "I think I see what you're getting at." Church, it's, it's an extreme example, and you may be sitting there going, well, I don't drive a new truck, or, you know, I don't this, or I don't that, or whatever. I'm using that as an extreme example, but, I mean, listen, y'all can do whatever you want. You can act however you want. You can buy whatever you want. You can watch whatever you want. You can live in as big of house as you want. You do you. I'm not your daddy. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not getting on to you. But if you can't fool a simple-minded preacher like me, how are you going to fool the God of the universe? If you can't fool me and if you can't fool your neighbors, how are you going to fool him on the day of judgment? You do whatever you want, but I'm telling you right now, Abby and I will be riding our bicycles around town before we rob from God. I mean, you, you do whatever you want, but I will get rid of every TV in my house and every cord that's connected to them before I rob from God. I mean, you live how you want, spend that money how you want, but if you can't fool me, how are you going to fool him? See, I know that a good start is important. I know that a good start is better than a bad one. And so, and you and your house, y'all do whatever you want. But as for me and my house, we bring the tithe here from our first fruits. It's a discipline in our lives. It's important to us. has been for two decades, almost three now. And I don't want you to give because I'm telling you to do it. I don't want you to give because you leave here feeling bad. I want you to give because you want to honor the Lord with your wealth. I want you to give not, not so you can get a good start. I want you to give because you know that this is something God wants to use in your life and for your life. It's one of the most easiest and most evident principles in Scripture. I love what 2 Corinthians 9 6 through 8 says, it says, the point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously, guess what, will also reap generously. But catch verse 7, each person should do as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly, not out of compulsion, not because the preacher made you feel bad about it. You got to do it from your heart. And here's why God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. And then look at verse 8. And he is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Abby and I have come to a place in our lives where we're, we're able to help people with groceries and rent. We're able to give above and beyond our tithe on a regular basis. We're not wealthy people. We're not rich people. But there were times in our life where tithing was an extreme struggle. But you, we never went hungry. God always provided for us in every way because we trusted him. And it got us off to a good start in our marriage, in our life, in everything we do. Honestly, the more I give, the more I realize all I have to be thankful for. 
Every time I give, I realize, wow, God has blessed me in such amazing ways. I'm thankful that I can give. I'm thankful when I go back there and look at the mission wall and the church planning wall and see what happens when I give. I'm thankful when I fill a shoebox. I'm I'm thankful when I get to serve. I'm thankful whenever I get to be generous with the time and the talents and the treasure God has given me. I'm thankful when I look around on our campus and I see walls going up and and I know that, hey, my giving was a small part of that. I could have never done it on my own, but it was a small part of that. And God's going to use it, not just during my lifetime, but for generations to come. I'm thankful, and it brings gratitude to my heart. Not in a way to puff me up and say, oh, look how good you are. It just, it's like, wow, look what God is doing. Because I was faithful to do what he called me to do. When I give, I'm thankful for all the others who are giving alongside of me and helping make these things possible. See, gratitude springs from generosity more than you might imagine. And a good start is better than a bad one. So I want to start my week by bringing the tithe into God's house. If you think you're going to outgive God, don't worry about that. You won't. If that's what's on your mind right now, don't worry. You can never outgive Him. God was so generous, he sent his son to die for you on the cross. You're not going to top it. He was so faithful, he sent Jesus to suffer and die so you could live. You're not going to beat that one. God's foresight was so great that he himself allowed the tree to grow that would produce the timber that he would one day tack his son to for you. You're not going to beat it. Jesus gave his blood and his very life for you. The Bible says he died for you and he died for me while we were still sinners, enemies of the cross. If you're here today and have never accepted his love and his grace and his mercy, if you've never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I pray you would accept the generosity of God this hour. And that as that generosity and that grace washes over you, you will realize that he's called you to be generous too. Let's pray. If you've never given your life to the Lord, we invite you this morning to do that. You don't have to walk to the front or raise a hand, but just pray with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I'm convinced and fully realized that I'm a sinner, that I've messed up and that I've gone astray. So, Lord, I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. I ask by faith that you would make me new and whole. That you would wash my sins away and make me clean. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I thank you for your grace and your goodness for your love and for your mercy for your peace Lord we're so grateful for who you are and for the ways you move and for your patience and your faithfulness Lord for your generosity and your foresight for giving us an opportunity to come into the faith as co-heirs to the kingdom of God, adopted sons and daughters of the creator of it all. Lord, if we don't receive anything else on this planet, we have more than we deserve already. So help our hearts to be grateful, filled with joy and gratitude and Lord, my prayer is for those who can hear me this hour that you would give them a good start to this new week, a good start to this new day. And that every day we would realize that getting a good start is better than getting a bad one. So we would make every effort to do it. Your way. The way you call us to. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise and honor you. In Jesus' name.